We hope you enjoyed the breakfast out there. We are going to go ahead and get started. Dear guests, dear brothers, dear sisters, most importantly, dear friends, we feel like you all are our friends and actually family members. Those of you who know us as the uh, Hizmet followers who came here 10 years, 20 years ago with no one together with them, maybe their wives only and a couple of kids here, you are our family members. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to the event here. Before I invite our guest speaker here, I will take a couple of minutes of uh, introduction. I will start with introducing uh, myself with my uh, baby picture up here. <laughs> my name is Ali Uslu. I'm standing here as a 37 years of Hizmet follower. So I would like to make that announcement. I'm a proud member of Hizmet community and I would love to hear what Dr. Aslan Luan will share us here today. That being said, without remembering what has happened recently a couple of uh, weeks ago, we can move forward. I will just show a 20 seconds video of what happened back in Turkey and Syria and we are going to get going from there. <laughs> On early Monday morning, a deadly earthquake hit the southeastern part of Turkey and northern Syria. In fact, Turkey was hit by two earthquakes of 7.8 and 7.5 magnitudes, followed by more than 60 aftershocks, making 10 cities disaster zones. Free so you know and you watch a lot of those videos and we have seen some of you uh, coming here and joining us here with the vigil that we held here with all of the brothers and sisters and actually uh, other friends and guests from other faiths as well. Uh, being together with the friends from different faith traditions, praying for the victims of earthquake in Turkey and Syria and supporting affected community members was so meaningful having them here and as you may have seen uh, we were in the media, in some uh, newsletters and uh, news media as well. Thank you so much for your presence and prayers and supports on that day. That being said, many organizations uh, and individuals have helped us to collect donations, to collect goods, to collect money and send to Turkey and Syria. Here are some of the organizations that have collected money on that day. We would like to thank you all and individuals as well who have donated. We had a lot of uh, friends and brothers and sisters bringing their donations to the cultural center here as well and also donating to these uh, profitable uh, companies, uh, organizations. Jazakallah khair for all of that that you have done. In addition to that, uh, Turkish American Society of Chicago uh, started a GoFundMe cam campaign to help our friends and brothers and sisters that are related to the cultural center. In addition to that, one of the organizations, Embrace Relief, has collected more than $1 million uh, to send to Turkey and Syria. And actually the CEO of this organization is one of my friends from college, and I had a phone call with him yesterday and according to him, uh, we have collected a lot of food, clothing, medical supplies, furniture, baby care items, and hygienic items. But at this time, unfortunately, in kind donations of these products uh, are not accepted anymore because of the overcapacity. So they would prefer uh, money donations moving forward. There's still need for that moving forward. So that being said, you all are here uh, in this facility. This facility houses a lot of different organizations that are tied to this movement, including Turkish American Society of Chicago, Islamic Society of Midwest, Embrace to Leave, Niagara Foundation, and Huddle Masses. So we are thankful having all of these organizations here. From time to time, we are inviting you here to the programs, but we are here most of the time. This is our second home for us, for these followers and we are uh, thankful for that. Uh, that being said, Islamic Society of Midwest has an event coming up. Uh, they are organizing a trip to Balkans. It's an eight day, seven nights trip. It's open to any brothers and sisters here in the room and you can extend the invitation to any others as well. 
Uh, for the details, there are flyers on your tables. You can take a look at that and you can visit the website and get registered. And actually, it's the last two days for the early bird for $200 off. Another uh, reminder from Islamic Society of Midwest, Ramadan is coming up. Every Ramadan, uh, we are hosting a lot of iftar dinners here at this facility. You can come and join as a guest, or you can also host any uh, dinner here any night to your friends and uh, colleagues or to the community as well. So please, again, visit Islamic Society of Midwest website to uh, register and to host any iftar dinners. And actually, we have one date already set. Islamic Society of Midwest will have their community dinner on March 25th. You can mark your calendars to be here for the Ramadan community iftar that has been called for like from Islamic Society of Midwest. Um, some housekeeping items. Uh, during the presentation, Dr. Dr. Alpaslan Doan will start. We want you to send your questions and uh, feedback through, through your like text messages or emails. You can use uh, my email, which is aliuslu.gmail.com, or you can send any of those questions and uh, feedback to my cell phone number, which is two. 224-888-0177. We'll try to answer all of your questions at the end of the session. Bathrooms are on the right in the hallway. We have hot drinks available on the left and bottled water on the back over there. And masjid is behind the wall and there will be lure prayer at 12.15 p.m. a year. That being said, we want you uh, to do three things here. One, be present during the presentation. Two, ask questions to yourself and to us via text or email. And three, share your feedback here and also share what you hear and learn from here with all others who couldn't make it here today. And before I invite Dr. Aslan to the stage, I would like to share a short video of core values of his math movement that was prepared by uh, the Alliance for Shared Values. HESMED is a faith-inspired social movement that focuses on education, dialogue, and humanitarian relief. HESMED began in Turkey as a grassroots community in the 1970s. Since then, HESMED, which literally means service in English, has expanded globally into a wider social effort whose participants come from all walks of life. HESMED's core values respect for humans and fundamental human rights. HESMED participants believe that every human being has inherent value and everyone should be treated with dignity. Every person is equal as a human being and before the law, and no one person is superior to anyone else. HESMED participants uphold all human rights and freedoms expressed in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Social justice and equal opportunity are requirements for equality among people. Respect for the rule of law. Hizmet participants respect the rule of law. They do not see anyone as above the law, and they act within the framework of protection of human dignity, universal legal principles, and the laws of their country of residence. They manage their organizations in a way to meet or exceed the transparency and accountability norms of their society peaceful and positive action. HISMA is a peaceful movement. HISMA participants reject using violence as a political tool. HISMA participants prefer positive and constructive actions and reject hostility-driven and destructive actions. Empowerment of women. HISMA participants are committed to the ideal that women are provided with equal opportunity and can contribute to all aspects of society without discrimination and they strive to meet this ideal in all activities. Ethical action. HISMET participants pay attention to both ethical norms and moral principles in their activities. 
They abide by fundamental ethical principles, including honesty, trustworthiness, harmlessness, and fairness. They believe that legitimate and rightful goals should be obtained through legitimate and rightful means. Respect for diversity, pluralism. Kismet participants see collective and individual diversity as richness, as long as they do not contradict fundamental human rights. They adopt an attitude necessary to avoid conflicts that stem from differences in sacred beliefs. Voluntary participation and altruism. For Hizmet volunteers, joining activities or leaving them is a person's individual choice. Hizmet participants contribute to projects that bring to life their values and benefit humanity through donations and volunteer work. Consultation and shared wisdom. Hizmet participants benefit from shared wisdom through discussions of different perspectives and opinions. Civic nature, independence. Hizmet is a civil society movement and acts independently. It is not an extension of a state or a political entity. Hizmet volunteers emphasize the internalization of democratic values, active citizenship, and community participation, and they respect every individual's political choices. They stand against turning religion into a political ideology or making religion a tool of politics. Civic engagement and contribution to society. Hizmet participants consider it a social responsibility to contribute to society and to help solve societal problems. They see themselves as part of the human family. They are sensitive toward humanity's problems and aim to serve humanity. Protecting the environment. Hizmet participants view our Earth, including all the ecosystems within it, as a trust that we must preserve for future generations, and they strive to protect the environment. Holistic view toward humanity and unity of the mind and the heart. Humans are both material and spiritual beings. Spiritual discipline should be pursued along with reason and scientific research so that their material and spiritual needs are met and they can flourish in both dimensions. Hizmet participants envision a society where people live in peace and harmony, where every human being is treated with dignity and their rights are protected, and where diversity is appreciated and dialogue is cherished among people of different religions and cultures. Hizmet is a faith-inspired... So at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce you Dr. Al Aslan Duan, who is the Executive Director of the Alliance for Shared Values, a non-profit organization that promotes bringing together citizens of diverse backgrounds, especially Muslims, Christians, Jews, and members of the world's diverse faiths around shared values of humanity. Local partners of uh, Alliance for Shared Values focus on interfaith and intercultural dialogue. Prior to his current position, Dr. Aslan Duan served as the board president of the Institute of Interfaith Dialogue in Houston, Texas. Dr. Aslan Duan is the co-author of The Messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and His Life of Compassion, published by Blue Dot. He published columns in CNN.com, Huffington Post, and FoxNews.com, and serves as a contributing editor for The Fountain Magazine and on the board of scholars and practitioners of the Journal of Interreligious Dialogue. He holds a PhD in computer science. He is married with two sons. He's a former Chicagoan. He is coming from uh, California. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and I'm really glad it's good to be back in Chicago. Uh, I lived here for eight years uh, as a PhD student. Uh, one of my first first people that I met was Brother Ahmed Rehab here. Uh, probably some of you know him uh, from CARE. Uh, so we were studying religion and science uh, in our study circle, little study circle uh, at uh, UIC. 
Uh, then we met uh, Brother Usman Baki, I don't know if you, any of you know him, uh, from MCC. Uh, initially, uh, we were trying to engage in interfaith dialogue, so we asked for help from MCC. Uh, we met with Osman, Brother Osman Baki, he uh, introduced us to, there was a sister, I think Nancy Ali or uh, Mary Ali, I don't know, maybe both of them. Uh, so she uh, told us some things, but then Brother Osman Baki said, okay, uh, me and my friend who was actually at Northwestern, I was doing my PhD at UIC. So he said, uh, you know, there's a group of uh, students at our school. Uh, I'm not sure if that was called MCC school back then, but there was a school in one of the suburbs. So he arranged the uh, ACT uh, prep class <laughs> for us to help uh, the MCC the kids. So our interfaith uh, engagement turned out into interfaith engagement <laughs> to meet with the other Muslims uh, in the Chicago area and to help the, the high school kids. And so that was like how many, 20 something years ago, or third, almost two. So that they are probably, you know, they are, they are their own children at college year, age maybe. <laughs> so that shows my age too a little bit, uh, but um, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so, inshallah, I'll, I'll try to give you an overview of the Hizmet movement because uh, some of you meet our brothers and sisters here and you know the, uh, you know, the first, uh, programs and activities and you meet the people. Of course, people always ultimately is the best indicator of any phenomenon, right? So, for, for us who are uh, in the movement, uh, it was the values that were lived by people that attracted us. For people who are interested in Islam, uh, non-Muslims, that is the values that they see in Muslims, you know, the good character of the Muslims that attract them first, not theory, not anything else. So his movement, as you have seen in the video, is it's a movement, uh, it's an essentially Islamic movement, but also humanitarian. So it, it has two natures in a sense. It is Islamic in the sense that uh, most, uh, almost 99.9% participants are Muslim. Uh, many of them come from uh, Turkish background, but increasingly, alhamdulillah, also from other backgrounds. Uh, in India, there is a dialogue center which is led by an Indian brother. Uh, in other countries, there are Muslims from other countries. And the mo movement is also open to non-Muslims, because our, uh, the idea is that around shared, the shared values of humanity, we can gather around them even, even if uh, somebody is not a Muslim. Because the shared values of humanity, uh, they are very deep and uh, you know, other religions, Abrahamic religions, uh, are based on the same revelation. Uh, therefore, there is a lot that, that we should that we can gather around. Uh, the movement uh, focused on education first, uh, then dialogue, uh, then humanitarian relief uh, in terms of chronology. Uh, so it started out as an education movement. It is essentially an education movement. But uh, the other areas are also uh, very important. Uh, our organization's website is afsv.org. Okay. Uh, so some of the information that I'll share, you can uh, reach them at our website, afsv.org. Let me start with the origin of the movement, because the origin of anything uh, gives you a lot of information about its nature. Uh, in the 60s and 70s of Turkey, when the movement originated, uh, the country was going through a very tough time. Uh, there was uh, poverty, economy was in shambles, uh, there was a lot of polarization, uh, violent conflicts. Uh, so that was between left and right. Uh, the right is more nationalistic and left is sympathetic toward the Soviet Union. Those were the Soviet Union days. Uh, so for the new generations now, I have to tell them what Soviet Union was. <laughs> So it was you know, uh, more powerful than Russia with the communist ideology. Uh, so on the streets, as a, a boy in elementary school, middle school, I could see uh, the youth fighting each other, fist fights, sometimes turned into gunfights. Thousands of youth literally died on the streets. At night, I remember, still the, the sounds are in my ear. At night, uh, the youth running on the streets, the police telling them, stop, stop, and then you know, some shooting going on. Uh, in the morning, when we wake up on the walls, there is a lot of graffiti, political nature, and uh, each side sees each other uh, as the enemy, and they, they should be destroyed, they should be eliminated. It, it was really, really a very tough time. Uh, one of our teachers got stabbed, uh, there were boycotts, people could not go to uh, classes, so on and so forth. 
Also, there was a lot of discrimination by the state uh, toward or against observant Muslims. You may know, somehow you may know the history of Turkish Republic. It was established by it based on a secular constitution, but it is not American secularism. It is not liberal secularism. It is very assertive, militant secularism. So the state saw observant Muslims uh, as a threat to the regime. So they discriminated against them in government positions. Uh, every government institution discriminated against them. Some institutions you could not enter at all, and some you could not, you could enter, but you could not rise. Like I have this silver ring uh, on my finger. With this silver ring, regardless of my degrees and qualifications, there are certain institutions I cannot enter at all, or I cannot rise. Because this is a silver ring, that means I'm an observant Muslim, I'm not wearing a gold ring, right? So that means uh, I am uh, a threat. In some institutions, like the military, they would actually check uh, and underneath your knee to see if you are praying. If you are praying and you, you're not allowed. Or they will test you with alcoholic drinks. They will offer alcoholic drinks. If you don't drink, you're out. So there was that discrimination. And this was compounded by the Muslim attitude, observant Muslim attitude in Turkey, which is about uh, one third of the country. So uh, Turkish society, although technically Muslim, 99%, they are not observant all. Only one third prays five times a day. One, the, the next one third prays the uh, Juma prayers. Uh, one time a week, and the other third doesn't uh, don't pray at all. They identify more with secularism, and so the Muslim observant Muslim attitude toward the state was that you know there's discrimination coming from the state, and the Muslims uh, are saying I'm not going to send my child to law school because it is the Western laws that is against Islam. I'm not going to send them to military because they're going to be forced to drink or you know do these things. I'm not going to send my son to uh, you know economics finance school because it is interest riba based. So what they end up with small shop owners or uh, laborers. So it was a very uh, you know uh, kind of double negative uh, combination. Uh, so uh, the movement emerged in this uh, background, in this context. So to keep this in mind, it emerged as a very small community around this preacher Fethullah Gülen uh, in the city of Izmir. This photograph is not from that era. I, unfortunately, I couldn't find a photograph from that era in the 60s in Izmir. This is from a, a later time, but from the same mosque where he preached originally about 30 years uh, earlier from this photograph. So all of a sudden people are hearing there is a preacher in this mosque. He is really good. He is really good in the sense that he is logical. You know, his language skills are, uh, he is looking, using the language really beautifully. And also he's telling the stories of the Sahaba. He is telling the story of the Prophet uh, in a way to motivate people toward good conduct and to do something about their society. And then the, the, the uh, mosque audience grows and grows and grows, and then it goes out of the mosque. And now, he's also a traveling preacher. Uh, he can uh, preach at other mosques. This is the system in Turkey that every imam and preacher has to be state licensed. Every preacher and imam is a state employee. They have to be. You cannot have an independent imam or preacher. It's a state one to control religion. <laughs> they actually tell them what to preach and so forth. Not, not at that time that, that much, but from time to time they, they uh, tighten the control. So uh, he is also able to preach in other uh, cities, and when people here actually they travel to hear him in another mosque. So he's very influential, and his cassettes, audio cassettes, are sold at the mosques. He is one of the three or four people whose cassettes are sold uh, around the country. But he is a maverick preacher. He is not an ordinary preacher. He is not just preaching in the mosque. He is opening up the mosque uh, Friday night for everybody. Uh, he is announcing, you know, sending messages to the neighborhood. You know, you can come to the mosque and ask any question that relates to religion uh, at the Friday night, like open house. <laughs> and then uh, he is also going out, visiting cafes and talking to the cafe owner. Can I give a talk here? Can I do a Q and A session here? Can you imagine? You know, people are drinking coffee and tea and other stuff, and you know, playing card games. Uh, and then there is a preacher from the mosque uh, trying to talk to you. <laughs> uh, very brave, uh, but he did that. He rented uh, movie theaters. Uh, to organize conferences on uh, religion and science, for instance, or, or other uh, contemporary topics. So he was a maverick uh, in every sense of the word, in a, in a good sense of the word. So what is he telling people? He's saying that we cannot delegate the education of our children to the government. You, you see the streets, you see what's going on. We need to provide them safe environments, first of all, to, to stay safe, to be alive. And secondly, for the religious observant Muslims, uh, students, to live their religion comfortably. And for the others to see good examples, or at least be safe uh, in a, in a uh, socially conservative environment. So he encouraged people to invest in education in different ways. 
if you are a parent, uh, you have a you know child, uh, you can uh, think about uh, maybe donating to a school. Uh, if you are a young person, you can consider uh, teaching as, as your career choice, although it's not the best paying job. Right? Uh, he organized students to go on uh, summer camps where the uh, curriculum is mostly religious education, but again, it's a safe environment, everybody support, there's synergy there. Uh, so they organized, uh, with the help of the people around him, they organized student homes where college students like myself, uh, you know, at the time in, in the 80s, uh, they could stay together, they pray together, they study uh, Islamic uh, books, uh, they support each other, so they are in a safe environment. Uh, they also uh, produce publications. Then they went to, uh, went on to other uh, projects like dormitories. Okay? In the rural areas, in the smaller villages, they don't have access to quality education. So uh, by establishing dormitories, they are allowing rural students to come to the towns and bigger cities to go to a better school, or to go to a school in the first place. And then it went on to college prep courses, which is very big in Turkey, into K-12 schools, and then to universities and free tutoring centers. This is a picture from a home that I stayed, uh, I think you can spot me there, uh, when I was a graduate student. So it's not from the early days, from the, the uh, later days. But it was pretty much like, like that. We have a, a library, a bookshelf, and then we do uh, the Friday night tea circle, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are some of the publications. The early publication was Susan. That was actually my first contact with the movement without realizing it. Uh, I loved science as a high school student, and uh, I was also faithful, not, not observant much, but faithful. And uh, I, I collected all the science magazines uh, in the town in every bookstore. I literally went to every bookstore and bought every science magazine. That, there weren't too, that, that many in Turkey at the time. Uh, so one day I see this magazine called Susan. And I see that it is about sciences, but it is uh, looking at the sciences from a Muslim perspective. I like that. I've not, not seen that before. I, I have science magazines, they just talk science. But this is saying that this scientific discovery or this observation is reflecting the names of God, uh, as my Husna. Uh, and you know, in this event, in this uh, phenomenon, we see this message from Allah. It is talking about sciences and also the Muslim perspective on the science. I, I love that. Uh, later on, a few years later, I, I learned that it was uh, Sheikh Fethullah Gülen and his uh, friends were publishing this magazine. Later on, they began to publish the Fountain magazine, which you can obtain here, I think, uh, or subscribe, uh, which is on the same basis. It is not only science and religion, uh, religion and uh, morality, religion and sociology, social sciences and humanities as well. <coughs> here, here are examples from a, a dormitory on the left. Uh, picture, uh, the building on the, on the background was a dormitory where students could come either locally or from other rural areas. On the right hand side is a school, private school with a dormitory. Uh, here is a picture from the advertisement of a college prep course. The college prep courses are very big in Turkey because by passing one exam you can get into the best school in the country. I mean, think about the Harvards and MITs of Turkey. Uh, you could get into them by just passing one exam. So it's very crucial. I'm not sure if that's the case still, but it was that, like that uh, for a very long time. So the college prep course, like the Silvan Learning Center, Kaplan, or whatever uh, you see around here, uh, those are very big in Turkey. And uh, he's met uh, participants. At that time, it was not called his met movement. It was not a movement yet. It was just maybe a few hundred people. And they started establishing college prep courses for the same, uh, in the same uh, mentality, the same uh, mindset. That it's a safe environment, we don't allow any kind of drugs or alcoholic drinks or uh, inappropriate boy-girl relationships or anything like that. It's a safe environment. Uh, students who want to pray can pray, there's a space for that. And they also get good quality academic education. And this particular college prep course is proud that they put 19 students into the medical school, and then 21 students into the law school, six into the pharmacy, and so on and so forth. 57 into uh, uh, engineering, uh, 137 into school of education, so on and so forth. And here's an example of a very successful, uh, one of the earliest ones, maybe the earliest one, uh, K through 12 private school. And the students at the bottom that you see, they won the uh, gold medal at the international, uh, I think one of them won the international uh, gold medal at the International Math Olympiads in 2011 in Netherlands. And they have many, many successes like that, championships in the uh, international world, Olympics in physics and mathematics, and uh, I met one of those students at some point. 
So in this particular picture, the Turkish National Science Foundation gives medals every year at that time it was giving. And out of the 92 medals, this, this one school collected 30 of them. One third of all the medals collected by one his med school uh, in Turkey. And it went on uh, to uh, colleges, universities. Uh, you have any pictures of the earthquake uh, in the beginning presentation. Gaziantep is at the very center of that uh, region. So in the city of Gaziantep, uh, this is later on, of course, in the 2000s, they established Zirve University. Uh, unfortunately, now it is taken from his med people and given to somebody else. Uh, but there were 15 universities before they were all shut down or given to other people by the Erdogan uh, government. And finally, the free tutoring services uh, that were offered to uh, kids with uh, you know, economic uh, disadvantage. Uh, in the southeast, they tend to be more Kurdish, but in the west of the country, it could be from any ethnicity, Turkish or Kurdish. And uh, kids get uh, support for getting into a good high school or good college. In the 90s, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, also Ismet participants went to uh, Central Asian republics, which share some cultural ties with Turkey. And uh, this example is from Kyrgyzstan. They established schools there, and then in the other countries, Kazakhstan, you know, all of the Istans, they established uh, schools there. And they went out to other countries. And uh, we are very proud that in places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, where girls have difficulty getting good education uh, sometimes. Uh, they established girls' schools. And we know, and you probably know that, you know, there's a false perception in the West that uh, Muslims don't want their daughters to be educated. That's not the case. Most Muslim parents do want their, almost all of them, do want their daughters to get good education. But they want a trustworthy school. They want safe environment for their school, especially in these regions. So his main people were able to earn the trust of the parents uh, so that, uh, yes, if it's a his main school, I can send my daughter there, and uh, she'll be safe there. Uh, Alhamdulillah, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, they established multiple, several schools, maybe, uh, I think, several schools. Uh, unfortunately, again, after the troubles in Turkey with the Erdogan regime, they were all uh, shut down or given to other unrelated people. In Nigeria, Tanzania, and Iraq, they still continue, girls' schools still continue. Uh, the governments there uh, uh, do not play into Erdogan's hands, so the schools there continue. This picture uh, is from uh, the school in Iraq. And this particular snapshot is from uh, the documentary Love is a Work, which is actually directed by a Chicago director. You might have heard of this one. It is an award-winning documentary, Love is a Work, by Terry Spencer Hesser. You can find it on Amazon as a DVD or streaming. Uh, interestingly, I also uh, found out that it is on uh, YouTube. Somebody uploaded it to YouTube, so you can get it for free. I recommend you purchase <laughs> if you're interested. But you can actually... Uh, I watch it on YouTube. Love is a verb is the name of the doing. So this is a Iraqi Kurdish lady, uh, his med sympathizer or participant, uh, teaching in girls' schools in, in Iraq. And they produce many engineers, scientists, uh, girls uh, in Iraq. In this documentary, they interview one of those girls who is working as an engineer in Iraq. And this one I do want to play if I if I can. Let me try. This is uh, a collection of the girls' schools, students from girls' schools around the world, which will give you a very good idea about what these med schools are doing around the world. Let's give this a try. Okay. This presentation originally was prepared by our colleagues in Germany, so there's a German introduction at the beginning, but the girls themselves, they speak English, so you'll be able to understand, inshallah. We are women. What's your superpower? We are women. What's your superpower? Hello, my name is Khadija Mohammed Nas. Okay. Let's escape this one. We'll try this again. It's entitled Girls for Future, Girls for Science. Hello, my name is Khadija Mohammed Nasser. I am in JSS1. My hobbies are reading and swimming. I would like to be a doctor in the future. 
Ms. Natalie, I'm a student in New Chai English program. I'm currently studying in grade 11. So you will notice that not all of them are Muslim because these schools are open to everybody. In some uh, places they are uh, majority Muslim or almost all Muslim like in uh, Tanzania for instance. But in other places it is a mixture and if the society is mixed, uh, the school uh, administrators make an effort to have the school mixed. In Philippines, I learned the story of a school in Philippines. There was a former Muslim school that they uh, kind of purchased the building. Uh, but uh, there are also Christians uh, in the Muslim majority region in the Philippines. So they actually went to the doors of the Christian parents to uh, ask them to send their kids with scholarships to the school so that they can study with the Muslim kids in Philippines. So they do this in, in many places. There are also kind of sad and interesting stories in uh, some places where the parents may be in conflict and they send their kids to the middle schools, like in Macedonia and some places like that. So this is probably a non-Muslim student. And I want to be an ambassador when I grow up. I want to meet a lot of people and I want to travel the world and learn about their culture. Hello, my name is Nicole Alfana and I'm from Mind International Girls School and I'm 15 years old and I want to be a software engineer and it's through my parents' motivational, the way they motivated me throughout the years it made me who I am today. Thank you. Good day everyone. My name is Moussa Alexander. I'm 16 years old and I'm SS3 and I aspire to be an astrobiologist. My name is Habiba Rashid. I am 15 years old in grade 10B in the Zaga School Mayfair. And in the future, I'd love to pursue a career in financial Hello, I'm Daniela Adosaki. I'm 16 years of age. I would like to be a gynecologist in the future. Myself, Amreen Bedu. I studied in Idol International School. Uh, at present, I'm studying in Upalia College, first year by PCE. I wanted, I wanted to become a gynecologist because these days we are seeing many girls and ladies are suffering from uh, different different kinds of problems. My name is Alicia Ali. I am 15 years old. I'm from Life Girls Academy. I'm in year 11A and I start to be a marine biologist. Hi everyone, I'm Sephora Padima, a great night from Impala International School. And inshallah, I'm going to become a pilot in future. I'm Romeo Nazizi, I'm 17 years old. I'm 12th grade and I'm a medium contract at International High School and I will become a successful doctor in the future. Hello, I'm Kristen. I'm Amoli, 16 years old. And I'm a student of Archerok High School. And I want to become a high qualified and educated pediatrician. And my school gave all opportunities for my day. Girls for future, girls for science. Girls for future, girls for science. So having you know seen these pictures, uh, they say if, you know a single picture tells a big story, and you've seen many stories there. Uh, you know, what is said about is that uh, it's one of the top priorities of Turkish diplomats now to help shut down these schools in, all around the world. That's their first duty. Uh, you know, regardless of what happened in Turkey, what's the reason for the troubles, uh, doing this I think is immoral. Uh, what do these people have to do with anything in Turkey? Anyway, I don't want to uh, spend much time on that because we want to focus on positive, inshallah, uh, for the future of uh, Muslims in, in the world in America. So let me go back to this. Now this is also available on YouTube, uh, Girls for Science. Uh, I'm not sure there's another tag that you need to. Girls for Future, Girls for Science, Women in Science. And the foundation is German, Stiftung Dialog and Bildung, the foundation for education and dialogue in German. Uh, and I'll be happy to give further links if anyone is interested. Okay, so uh, is med schools flourish in uh, non-Muslim countries where there are very few Muslims or not, not, uh, not at all. And uh, a professor, uh, Professor Vincent Perillo, went around several countries to ask parents, you know, what, what, is, what do you find in the school attractive for you? Uh, especially for, for the, I 
guess both parents uh, Muslim and non-Muslim. And they cite uh, three or four main factors. One of them is, uh, of course, academic excellence. They teach multiple languages. They uh, organize cultural exchange trips. Uh, they say uh, what is most important for us is that uh, both students and the parents, there's a special relationship between teachers and students because they, you know, teachers don't see this as a, just a salary paying job. It is a job that gives meaning to their lives. And also, this is a safe environment. I, I'm assured that my uh, daughter or son will be safe in this school. And uh, I have a personal anecdote about this uh, value of protecting our youth from uh, destructive uh, habits or influences. Right? Uh, one of my friends was a school principal, a vice principal in Romania. Uh, as you know, Romania is uh, almost, there's a small Turkish minority, but it's most predominantly Christian country. So a Romanian Christian parent was sending his son to this uh, Ismail school in Romania, and his son had uh, disciplinary problems. And the school gave him warnings and uh, certain uh, consequences, and it came to the point that where he was to be expelled from the school. Then the parent lobbied the school administration, went to the city, lobbied the city government, to the state government, to the national government. And it came to the point where apparently he was influential. Uh, the government was going to shut down the school if they expelled this one student. <laughs> and then, so the school administration obviously is in a dilemma. They had disciplinary problems, so they had to do something. But if they expel him, the school is going down. So they sit with the parent, they, they tell him, okay, we're going to let your son study with the system, but in a different campus. But you'll have to move to a different city. And the father is very happy, he moves his son to this other campus. He says, as long as he's in this system, it's okay, it doesn't have to be this campus. And they ask him, you know, what is the big deal here? Why did you make such a big deal out of this? You could easily send your son to another school in the city, there are other good schools. And he said that, I know that my son has a tendency to do drugs, he has a leaning toward that. And I know that your uh, staff members and faculty members, they patrol the periphery of the school so that no drug dealer can even approach the school, let alone entering the school uh, or any, anybody bringing drugs to school. So if, if I send my son to any other school, I'm losing him. So rather than losing him, I did this loving. So that is a value, protecting youth from harmful substances or addictions or habits that, that is shared by all humanity. It is not just Muslim, it is Christian and values of any other religion. So that's an example. Uh, there are also private schools in the US. Uh, this, is, this picture is from the Amity School, originally a girls' school, now it's a mixed school in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, uh, some of our brothers and sisters also entered the public education sector in the United States. So they are public schools, they are working for public schools, sometimes they establish public charter schools, and they work there as a teacher, as an administrator. Uh, you, you have uh, listened to Ali who was one of those people. Uh, so this one particular school in Minnesota happens to be predominantly population, student population-wise, uh, Somalian. So uh, you know, they reflected that fact in their website, actually, uh, showing some of the students uh, who migrated from Somalia. And of course, here you know that there's the Science Academy of Chicago. Uh, let me talk just a little bit about uh, Gulen's background because uh, you may be surprised how can a single preacher, you know, talking to a group of people, how can this group can uh, grow so rapidly uh, from just a few people around the preacher to now uh, over a million people in Turkey. So within the span of only three decades or so, it, it went from just a few people to a million people. How did that happen? So to understand this, we, we look at uh, the background of course, uh, you know, the short answer is it is about, because, because it's about values. It's not about a person. Because people, when they see values lift, they gather around it. They want people to trust. It is not about the person, it is about the values that are lived by that person. So in terms of Gülen's personal background, he was born in the northeast part of Turkey. His mother was his first Quran teacher. He finished reading the Quran in an early age, four or five years old. Then his father was his first Arabic teacher. His father uh, also was an imam. Uh, he was trained, uh, he joined the circles of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Lutfi of Alwar. And he also took fiqh classes from uh, a former Ottoman madrasa teacher, Osman Bektaş in Erzurum. But his biggest influence was Said Nursi. Uh, I think some of you have heard about Said Nursi. So Gulen did not personally meet Said Nursi, but he met his students. They are two different generations. 
So uh, Nursi's teachings, writings, his example was very, very strongly influenced, influential in Gulen. And also, uh, after Nursi died, uh, his movement was continued by his students. So two or three of uh, Nursi's students were very close with Gulen. So his met movement is not an offshoot of Nur movement, but uh, Nursi's influence is very important. So much so that from the early days when I first stayed in a student home in the 80s to this day, Nursi's books are read regularly in the student homes. Uh, when we were students in college, we finished all of his uh, literature, which is about 6,000 pages. So we literally finished the 6,000 pages as a student in college. So to this day, they continue to, to read this. Of course, for the new generations growing up in America, the language is a challenge. Nurji's language is uh, Turkish mixed with Arabic and Persian. So the younger generations are finding difficult. English translations uh, are supplied, but they don't do justice to the original, of course. Uh, originally, I prepared this uh, presentation for an Muslim audience, so some of this may be obvious to you, but I'm just going to read it just in case. Uh, so in the Muslim world, uh, his mad movement and uh, Shafatullah Gulen fall into the Sunni world, which is 85% of the Muslim world. And in the uh, Sunni world, there are uh, four major schools of jurisprudence, as we call them, or Amadi uh, Madhab. In terms of your practical life, uh, you follow uh, some of the, uh, either an individual scholar or his school. Uh, so when we say Hanafi, Shafi, it is not just one person, Imam Shafi, Imam Hanafi, but it is also their students. Uh, so they establish these schools of uh, religious practice. And also we have the Itikad, method of Itikad. So in, the, in terms of that school, uh, Gülen and his men fall into the, mostly the Turkish uh, participants in the movement fall into the Hanafi, Maturidi tradition. The Kurdish participants, which is about, I think, 10-15% of the movement, fall into the Shafi Ashari tradition, which is pretty much like what Turkey is. You know, the Muslim observant Turks in Turkey in the Hanifi school and the Kurds are in the Shafi school. And in terms of uh, spiritual awareness, uh, uh, they follow, the scholars also follow the Islam tradition, which is, in addition to the formal practices, uh, outward practices, they also pay uh, a lot of attention to the inner dimension of Islam. Uh, so there's a just to tell you the story uh, uh, as an anecdote to tell you the uh, the meaning of that uh, in the spiritual tradition the essence is more emphasized than the form right so one day this person is praying this is a story told in the spiritual tradition uh, this person is praying and then another one comes by nearby and says salam alaikum and then when this person finishes the salat he says don't you know that you're not supposed to give salam to somebody who's praying? And this other person says, well, you were not praying. You were counting the, uh, you know, the grapes in your uh, vineyard, graveyard. So they are saying that you, know, you may be doing the form of salam, but is your heart in salam? Is your mind in salam? So the spiritual tradition basically follows the sum of the practice of the Prophet and also uh, Khulafa al-Rashidin and other Sahaba uh, to also feel in that form, uh, feel the essence in that form. Yes, you are praying, but is your heart in there? Is your mind in there? So some of the practices that are not practiced by majority Muslims, these scholars practice that, like night prayers, tahajjud, right? Very important in Prophet's life, he did it all the time, but unfortunately, majority Muslims don't do it, night prayers. Or uh, fasting, we do Ramadan, but other than that, we don't do much. But the Prophet uh, regularly did Mondays and Thursdays, and some months he did much more. Uh, so some of these practices, zuhd practice, you know, trying to minimize your consumption and your needs and so on and so forth. That is the Ihsan tradition. Uh, and probably you know the hadith where uh, Jibreel salam came in the form of the Hidr Kalbi to tell him about Islam, Iman, and Isa. So that's what I mean. So in the Islamic tradition of ulama, uh, alims, uh, they uh, serve as a scholar, so they study and share their knowledge, but that's not the only thing they, they do. Too. The other thing is as a preacher, they speak to crowds, uh, mosque audiences or outside. They also teach personally, they mentor students. And finally, many of the uh, ulama that you know, or the uh, founders of the Madahib, they are also social advocates. And interestingly, uh, those founders of the Madahib and their students, they also got into trouble with the political entity in their lives. If you study their lives, Imam uh, Shafi, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, uh, uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and all of them, their students, you can see in the, some of the some point in their lives they got into trouble with the political leaders, because political leaders usually uh, in this Muslim majority world they want the scholars, Muslim opinion leaders, to be uh, kind of obedient, to always endorse them regardless of what they do. 
Okay, whatever the leader chooses to do, they expect the scholar <coughs> to endorse it. Okay, uh, you did great, oh, uh, the Imam of the Muslim Ummah. And then the Imam makes a U-turn, uh, the leader makes a U-turn, they expect him to, okay, that was a beautiful U-turn that you did. But the scholars cannot do that. They have to first be true to Islamic principles. They cannot endorse every political action. Therefore, they end up in, in jail, uh, sometimes tortured, sometimes uh, barred from life, uh, exiled. We see this in the lives of all the major scholars in Islam. Unfortunately, here are some pictures from Gulen's life as a uh, Muslim alim scholar. This uh, uh, halakha study circle uh, that they study uh, tafsirs of Quran. Uh, they do a comparative study, like 10, 15 different tafsirs. Uh, they comparatively study them in this circle. Uh, they also study hadith, fuqh, and other Islamic sciences uh, with a group of students who are graduates of School of Divinity, mostly from Turkey and also from Al Azhar and other places. And uh, they also space for lady students up, up in there in the, you, you may see, you know, if there are, uh, some of these brothers have, uh, you know, their wives have studied Islam also, they can join the study circle here or in this picture, over here there's a section, so it is not discriminating against women. Uh, Gulen's sermons began in Izmir, but uh, in the, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, they uh, began to attract very large crowds, uh, you, you may have visited the big mosque in Istanbul, Suleymaniya, Blue Mosque, which we call Sultan Ahmed. Uh, so he gave some sermons in those mosques and they were full. Uh, the whole mosque and also the courtyard of the mosque were full. And in, in this particular uh, sermon in Suleyman, Sultan Suleyman's mosque in Istanbul, I was there actually as a student, uh, and it was uh, kind of a you know uh, interesting incident because the mosque was full uh, in the early morning and the sermon will start at noon. So the regular audience, regular uh, mosque goers in that neighborhood, they don't have space to enter the mosque. So there was an announcement, they said, you young people, can you please make some space for the regular mosque goers? Because <laughs> there's no space left. Everybody came in the early morning, I mean from night. Some people spend the night. So it could easily fill a stadium uh, in Turkey. His efforts in social advocacy, interfaith dialogue, has been recognized at the highest level in Turkey uh, in the previous governments. Suleyman Dem uh, Demirel, uh, Prime Minister and then President, praised some of these efforts. Turgut Özal praised them. Uh, sorry. Uh, Tansu Çiller, Prime Minister, Mesut Yılmaz, Prime Minister, Ecevit, Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, President Clint also praised the interfaith dialogue efforts of the Izmir movement. There's a video, I'm not sure if that's on YouTube, but uh, you can probably find out. Kafi Annan came once to come, come to visit Gülen Institute. So what were the factors in, in this influence? First of all, he was offering a holistic view of the religion. Not cherry-picking hadith or verses, but looking at the religion as a whole. Uh, you are familiar with, some of you, familiar with the, the concept of Makassad al-Sharia. What are the ultimate goals of Islam? Right? So you have to interpret everything in context. Uh, the Asbab uh, al when the verses are revealed, or hadith, when, when it is said, to whom, in what kind of context, historical context, sociological context, etc. So holistic view of the Islam, not cherry-picking. Integration of science and spirituality, which was one of my attraction points uh, in Gulen's uh, sermons. Uh, inclusiveness, embracing all humanity, aiming to sor sor serve all humanity, and also seeing humanity as brothers and sisters in humanity. So as uh, Ali Radiallahu says, uh, all Muslims are my brothers and sisters in Islam, and all humans are my brothers and sisters in humanity. That is the attitude. Sound reasoning and communication. Uh, when I was a student in Turkey, it was literally painful for me to listen to some sermons by other preachers. They make grammatical mistakes, they make logical mistakes, they treat the audience like children, they attack this, they attack that. I mean, I would go to the mosque and it, I, almost like I, I don't want to really hear this. It was so terrible for me. So when I began to listen to Gulen's sermons, that was like, you know, very uh, enlightening. And finally, devotion to social advocacy. You know, uh, scholars in Islamic tradition, they devote their lives uh, to the uh, cause of Islam, also the cause of humanity, and people can feel that. Every person can feel the other person, because when two people come together, the souls can see each other, and they can feel. There is no deception when two human beings come together. You know, they can try to deceive with words, but the soul sees the other soul. So, uh, I, I mentioned that his met started as an education movement, that, but that was you know, one aspect of it, because uh, the, the society was suffering from uh, this political polarization and conflict 
uh, young people dying, there is need also for dialogue. Because people were not talking to each other. So to the leftist, the other one is nationalist the enemy. To the uh, rightist nationalist, the other one is leftist the enemy. Uh, he is a servant of the Soviet Union. And uh, the, to the leftist, the right, right one is the servant of the capitalist Western imperialist world. They are not talking to each other. They are fighting or killing each other. So the idea is that how can we give the, uh, the notion that it is possible to resolve our differences or at least have a civilized conversation? We cannot do this at the grassroots level at first because it's very tough, but we can do it at the level where we have some, some level of consciousness in the opinion leaders. So Gulen and his friends at the Journalist and Writers Foundation, they went out to establish dialogue platforms, dialogue events, where they group together leaders and recognize faces of every political segment or ethnic segment or religious segment of Turkish society. So in this one particular picture, you see on the right hand side at the top, a kind of a nationalist, uh, moderate, Kemalist, columnist, also a faithful person. Uh, over here you see an actor, movie actor in Turkey, very famous, uh, but he is a leftist and uh, probably against most forms of Islamic expression. Uh, here you see an environmental activist. Uh, you could say he's leftist. I mean, these terms, of course, uh, you know, they have different meanings, but uh, he's not observant Muslim. Let me just say that. He's not observant Muslim. He's not against Islam, but he's definitely not observant at all. He's very secular in, in his lifestyle. Here is a uh, columnist, observant Muslim, supporter of Erdogan. You see Erdogan himself here also attending as the mayor of Istanbul these events. And you see people, this is a, this is a kind of a a uh, moderate nationalist, also faithful singer, one of the most famous singers of the country. So the idea here is that people, you know, all of these people are loved by millions of people. When they see them coming together and having a dialogue, people begin to think, yes, we don't have to fight every time. We can actually listen to each other. We can have a civilized dialogue. That was the idea. And the logical next step, of course, was the interfaith dialogue. They also did that. They invited the leaders of the Turkish religious minorities for dialogue events. A highly publicized event uh, because up until that time uh, the religious minorities were invisible uh, in Turkey and they were always suspect. Just like Muslims are sus uh, suspected in, in, in the US, people say, Is your loyalty to you know, Islam or the United States as if they have to be in conflict? So Turkish people were asking, you know, Greek Orthodox people or Armenians or Jews in Turkey, Is your loyalty to Turkey or some, somewhere else? So they were always suspect. And of course, Turkish nation building used this enemy rhetoric a lot. Our enemies are this and that, and they able to be Jewish Christians, and so on and so forth. So the religious minorities uh, suffered a lot in modern Turkish Republic, which is supposed to be secular. So Gulen brought these leaders to the front, to the fore, and after he did this, all the Muslims began to invite them to their events. So they uh, very quickly became popular. <laughs> uh, one of them was saying, the Assyrian leader, was saying that you know some years ago, nobody would talk to us. Now, in my calendar, I have a hard time finding time to attend a Muslim event. So that was also successful. And at that time, Turkish Directorate of Religious Affairs also established an office of interfaith dialogue. Now, uh, the other missing piece, of course, what we're doing today, we're trying to do today, that is the interfaith engagement. Uh, when uh, Ismet participants went to other countries, they were initially very reluctant to engage with other Muslim communities. Uh, there are various reasons for that, but of course, regardless of the reason, it's not right, and they are beginning to wake up to that. Maybe one of the factors is, is the realization that Muslim identity is the only identity that will uh, keep our children. You know, Turkish identity will not sustain them. The, the American culture is so strong, their ethnic identity will not sustain them. Only Muslim identity will sustain them. So to, to preserve our uh, generations, we have to emphasize that we have to have better relations with our Muslim brothers and sisters. So there's this realization. So there's a lot of interfaith dialogue, uh, interfaith dialogue efforts, uh, engagement efforts, and we, uh, we are encouraging our brothers and sisters to engage with their Muslim uh, friends from other backgrounds, other countries. Uh, last, in the last Istana, they organized a few panels and they encouraged hundreds of people from the movement to attend the event. And uh, the, the mosques uh, around the country, if David has met, they are organizing activities to improve uh, Muslim to Muslim engagement. There is a lot of people again lost their lives. So, this humanitarian relief organization called Kim Se uh, let me see if we see its name somewhere right here. Kimse Yokmo, which means, isn't there anybody out there? 
you know, people under the Roman were asking, isn't there anybody out there? Isn't there anybody out there who can save us? So they established a humanitarian relief organization that stirred people all around the world in disaster zones. At some point, they had a budget of $100 million annual budget, and they were spending most of this money on non-Muslim regions where people uh, support disasters. Uh, unfortunately, this was also shut down by the Erdogan government. Uh, this is an example of the Kim Yokmo organization serving uh, people in uh, Darfur region of Sudan. When they had troubles there, they went there to rebuild a village with a school, with a medical clinic, and so on and so forth. And he's met in the U.S., and I'll uh, try to conclude within the next 10 minutes with this. Uh, he's met in the U.S. now is continuing on the informal and formal domain. In the informal domain, uh, domain there are weekly halakas, gatherings, where uh, people study the religious uh, texts and also talk about social projects serving our community. Uh, some of the mentoring services continue on the informal domain, and student homes also continue for college students, and they also get to mentor high school students or middle school students. On the institutional level, there are cultural centers like this one. Some, some of them have mosques in them. Some of them don't, but just a masjid, like a room. Uh, mentoring services, some of them are done under institutions. Uh, there are dialogue institutions, like we have seven members of our regional, and they are bringing together Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Every year, they bring together about 60 to 100,000 Americans of different backgrounds together, uh, which is alhamdulillah good, but if you think about the adult population in the United States, that leaves uh, back 199 million, uh, 30,000 or something like that, still people to, to reach out to. So it, is, it takes the community, uh, effort of all American Muslim community to reach out to, inshallah, millions more people to have them an experience with a Muslim, uh, an engagement with a Muslim. Uh, there is a humanitarian relief organization in America which is called, uh, not here, it's called Embrace Relief, uh, continuing Kim Suyokmo's mission. Uh, there are five private schools, one in here, one in New, New Jersey, in New York, in uh, Georgia, and uh, in Virginia. Uh, I mentioned our brothers and sisters participating in the U.S. public education. Uh, we have, because of the troubles in Turkey in the last several years, there are now human rights organizations uh, focusing mostly on human rights abuses in Turkey, uh, reaching out to other organizations like United Nations, European uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, and other human rights watchdogs. And, and finally, and this is uh, something that I want to emphasize, uh, there are consultation platforms that tie these organizations together in an informal level at the kind of a uh, yeah, informal level. Uh, a picture from the school, private school in Atlanta. This used to be a charter school, then uh, they uh, converted it into a private school, and most of the parents continue to be parents by actually paying the tuition. They are very successful, alhamdulillah, uh, Fulton Science Academy in Atlanta. These are our partners in dialogue in America, Niagara Foundation here, uh, Pacifica Institute where I live now, Peace Science in New York. It's a summary of the Interfaith Dialogue events, 2,700 programs every year, and uh, at that time in the year, 40,000 people engaged. And uh, Sheikh Gulen, whenever he is available, he also ac accepts uh, religious leaders from other disciplines, Muslim leaders also, but uh, in the la last few years, his health has deteriorated considerably, so we ask you to pray for his health, inshallah. And one project that we are very uh, proud of is the Young Leaders in Civic Engagement Program as an example of the activities in, in America, is meant in America. So what we do is, uh, we award youth groups who uh, do a civic engagement project. In other words, they do something that helps the society, but in doing that, they bring together people of different backgrounds. These are the two conditions we ask from them. You choose the project, okay, help people who need uh, homeless people, help people who need food, or help people need training, or do something that benefits the society. But when doing that, bring together Muslims, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and others, people of different backgrounds together. Two conditions. And now that last year, we had uh, seven uh, submissions, five of them were awarded. It so turned out that uh, all of them were Muslim girls. <laughs> it was not required or uh, encouraged. Naturally, it so happened that all of them were done by Muslim girls. Uh, this year we have uh, more than double the project submissions and there are non-Muslim groups also submitting because it's open to all. Uh, the purpose is to uh, bring together, uh, facilitate a meaningful engagement uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims. That is our goal and also benefit the society. Okay, 
embrace relief was active during the COVID, heavy COVID uh, times. And this is a schema showing you the, uh, the informal uh, relationships among the organizations in the US. They are, there's no central organization that uh, uh, governs them, but uh, from every uh, community uh, in, in America, his met participant community, uh, from the local community circles, uh, individuals with professions, they attend uh, the city platform. Uh, like, it's like a Majlis to Shura, if you want. Uh, it's a discussion circle. And from the organizations, a board member and a director attend, and they discuss informally and come up with recommendations from individuals and organizations. They can organize this fundraising drive, what can you do, what can you do, what can you do, and they, they go back to their organizations and get the approval of necessary people and they uh, engage in that. And from city platforms, delegates go to the regional platform, and from regional platforms we form the uh, North American Civic Platform, which is the kind of national uh, Shura Majlis. And uh, in that platform, there are several committees, uh, Youth and Mentorship Committee, Nonprofit Governance Committee, helping organizations do a better job governing themselves, Finance Committee, Human Resources, Diversity and Inclusion, Integration, Planning and Communications Committees. And I'm going to finish with uh, the status of the moon around the world and the outlook for Hizmet in America. And uh, I didn't want to spend too much time in troubles in Turkey because I want to focus on positive things. But if anybody is interested, I'd be happy to uh, give an overview of uh, what happened in Turkey. So in terms of the status of the movement around the world, uh, in Turkey, every single Hizmet affiliated institution is either closed down, shut down, or given to somebody else. So basically taken away from original founders. These universities, 15 of them. Uh, you can imagine, each of them took many tens of millions of dollars to establish by, by donations by people like you. So they are taken away from the original founders and given to unrelated people. Uh, hospitals, there were 30 hospitals taken away from original owners and given to other unrelated people, Erdogan supporters. Uh, so every institution has been closed down. Uh, even five, six people cannot come together to the halaka because their neighbor can uh, call the government and they can get arrested. Uh, and their charge will be become, being a part of a terrorist organization. It is a charge. I want to show you just a uh, telling picture of uh, somebody who's on the wanted list for the terror crimes. You know, for years in America, we fought uh, to fight this uh, stereotype of associating Muslims with terror. Unfortunately, in Turkey now, in a, under a supposedly Muslim ruler, uh, Muslims are being put on the terror list. This is the professor, Suat Yildirim, who is a very famous professor of Tafsir al-Quran. He is now in Canada, and he is on, on the right-hand side, look at his picture, uh, next to Potentially, I don't know them, but potentially real terrorists. He is on the, on the top left corner, you can see terror, Aramanna, which means wanted, wanted for terror crimes. What could a professor of Tefsir could have done to deserve this? Uh, just to give you an idea. So regardless of what happened in Turkey, what is going on now is immoral. Uh, I think we can agree on that. And if you're interested, there are, basically every human rights watchdog has a report on Turkey. Human rights watch, uh, United Nations Special Reporter on Torture, you're seeing some uh, icons here. Amnesty International, uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, they, they all have condemnations or criticisms of Turkish human rights record uh, because it is uh, just, uh, you know, uh, amazing in a sad way. 600,000 people investigated, 300,000 arrested, including 100,000 women. Most of these are teachers, nurses, doctors, engineers. Uh, 117,000 sentenced and 69,000 currently on trial. This is so. This is the status of the movement in Turkey right now. And in the rest of the world, in democratic countries, the Hamdullah, there is no problem. About 60, maybe over 60, 70,000 Hizmet people escape Turkey to seek refuge in uh, democratic countries. In Germany, France, and Netherlands, UK, uh, Sweden, Norway, etc., Canada, Australia, United States. So in democratic countries, Alhamdulillah, the movement is flourishing, continuing its activities. In the semi-democratic or non-democratic countries, uh, the situation depends on the country's relationship with Turkey. If they have a close relationship with Turkey, our friends have to uh, get out of there. Or they can be sent to Turkey without legal proceedings. Freedom House recently issued a report saying that Turkey is now leading nation in the world for transnational repression, meaning kidnapping people illegally from other countries. They kidnapped over 80 people, most of them are Hizmet participants from other countries. 
And uh, in the countries which are not democratic but not under Turkish influence, Alhamdulillah, the activities are continuing over there. So I don't want to finish with that, but I want to finish with this. Uh, inshallah, we see uh, a flourishing future for his men movement together with American Muslims in America. Uh, because the future of his men in America is with American Muslims. Uh, many of our friends, brothers, we are, we, this is a relatively new community. I know that some brothers and sisters moved here like, many decades ago. Uh, but uh, most of our brothers and sisters from the Izmet community uh, have been here only for maybe a decade or less, maybe two decades, most of them. So it's a new community. They are getting used to uh, being uh, around non-Turkish origin Muslims. Uh, but uh, everybody realizes this need that we need to be, we have to be, we are part of the American Muslim community, but we need to make a conscious effort to do that. And inshallah, as part of the American Muslim community, uh, we hope to preserve our generations and help Muslim community and help America and help the movement, inshallah. inshallah. So, that's at the beginning that you may send your questions via email or text. At this time, I didn't receive any. So I will walk around and give the mic to you if you guys have any questions to Dr. Aslan Here we have. Thank you. We had a scholar named Abdullah just before your question. My name is Muhammad Salim. Oh, sorry, okay, go ahead. My name is Muhammad Salim, I'm the national director with the American Muslim Alliance and the American Muslim Task Force on Human Rights and Elections. Originally, I'm from Pakistan. I've been in this country for close to 15 plus years. Uh, my question to you is, the only thing I know uh, about uh, this uh, movement, uh, two things I know, uh, which I heard it. I, I should not say I know it, but, uh, but I heard. One of the things is that uh, the perception has been, our understanding, between the Pakistani American uh, that uh, Portugal is the Islamist and uh, he is he's standing up for the Turkish people and, uh, and I could be found out he put the pressure on Pakistan to shut down many of the schools in the you know, uh, uh, movement, which was really questionable for me. I have the opportunity to even meet uh, Mr. Erdogan during the, one of the uh, uh, UN press annual meetings, you know, maybe a year ago, when I advised you and something like that. What I understand, it's not like to divide up the left and right. Both of you, it appears to me, which I don't know, and maybe most of the people don't know, I mean, a lot of people still wonder, you know, I'm not perfect. What is the difference? It seems like you are, both of you are not brightest on the right side, but maybe just not is central, Center right. Okay. So, what is the real issue? The second thing which I learned, or, 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 we are told that there was a reward against Urtogan uh, by, by the military. And July 15 incident. Yeah, the Urtogan had a lot to do with that uh, uh, rebelliousness. <laughs> and so, that is the accusation. So, could you please, for our benefit, to understand it, especially people like me and many other, you know, most of them are here, who are involved in the civil rights, human rights, you know, those kind of things. What is the real issue between Urdogan or the current government in the Turkey and, and this movement? Okay, we really want to know. Thank you so yeah, much. Excellent question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, for Muslims looking at Turkey, uh, this is really puzzling. Uh, they see, you know, kind of two Muslim observed Muslim communities in Turkey who are supposed to collaborate, but they are in a big uh, conflict, a uh, very terrible conflict. It's hard to understand. There are different uh, kind of approaches or perspectives on this. Uh, the first one is your brothers, why don't you just, uh, you know, reconcile? Uh, unfortunately, things are not that simple. This is a very simplistic approach. Uh, as we have seen, there are very serious human rights abuses. So regardless of what the cause of the division is, uh, regardless of who did what, there is no justification for investigating 600,000 people. There is no justification for shutting down 30 hospitals, 15 universities, taking away 500 schools from people who have nothing to do with any of that. 
So there's no justification. Let's, let's uh, mention that. Now the uh, the division. Uh, you know, we of course we I'll provide our perspective uh, on that. So initially, most Vizmet participants supported Erdogan because Erdogan, as an observant Muslim, promised uh, to improve Turkish democracy. Uh, he said that we're going to make Turkey a member of European Union, we're going to improve freedoms, we're going to improve human rights and everything, and also liberalize more economy. And so those are all good promises that we could uh, rally behind. But uh, several years later, uh, we see the signs of an uh, authoritarian trend. Initially, he started out with promises of democracy. Actually, their party had this promise of three, fighting three wives. And in Turkish, the three wives are Yolsuzluk, yoksulluk ve yasaklar, which means corruption, very ironic, corruption, uh, uh, bans on freedoms, and poverty. They said, we're going to fight these three. Uh, but in several, several years into, the, into his government, especially, especially after the third election victory, uh, we began to see very clear signs of authoritarianism, that some of the checks and balances on the government are being remo removed one by one. And at some point, in, especially in 2012, uh, he began to pressure his movement, and especially Sheikh Gulen, to publicly support the idea of executive presidency. Now, uh, in principle, there is nothing against presidency system in Islam, but there has to be checks and balances. There has to be independent bodies who can uh, hold the president accountable. And that was not present, that was missing. So Sheikh Gulen said, I'm not against presidency per se, but in this system, there's no checks and balances. I am sure I cannot support it. That was the kind of the breaking point. Erdogan uh, like draw a line over Sheikh Gulen and his movement. And after that, we see step after step, uh, government pressure building. Uh, threats were issued. Uh, all of the college press courses that I showed you here, hundreds of them, they were shut down. Like Civil Learning Center, Kaplan, <laughs> they were shut down. Uh, intelligence uh, uh, agency was empowered to go after anybody with no accountability. So intelligence service, they can question and even torture people, and they cannot be brought to justice. Only their director can be questioned by the parliament or by the prime minister, not by an independent court. So that gave the blank check for torture to the intelligence service. So there were things like this, I, I don't want to go too long. There were things like this that showed clear signs of authoritarianism. And Ismet Moumoun said, we supported you because you promised democracy. Now you're making a U-turn. We're not supporting you anymore. So that was the main reason for the split. And there were exacerbating factors for the split. And I'm going to come to what you mentioned next, the July 15 incident. Before July 15 incident, there was the uh, 2013 December incident of public corruption probe. So the uh, investigators have been uh, uh, investigating the corruption uh, evidence against some of the cabinet members of Erdogan. And they discovered in one of the sons of the cabinet members, the minister's son, millions of dollars stashed in shoeboxes in his home. Big metal uh, uh, cash chests, right? multiple of them. You know, how, how can a minister's son they are not very rich, they are not businessmen. He is just a minister, minister's salary. How come he has uh, multiple chests of cash in his home? So they have many uh, evidence like that, video footage of an Iranian businessman bribing a minister, so on and so forth. So this uh, probe became public in December 2013. And instead of allowing the, the investigation to continue and go to the court, Erdogan said, this is against me. He's met with them, people are trying to bring me down. So he shut down the investigation, he dismissed the uh, prosecutors and police detectives, he overhauled the whole judiciary. And he said that they are trying to bring me down uh, like a judiciary coup, he said. This is before July 15. Now, I just want to record for the fact that that's not true, because the prosecutors don't have the jurisdiction to indict the prime minister or any of the ministers. They can only indict regular people, citizens. They cannot indict the prime minister, which Erdogan was, or my minister. So technically, they cannot bring down the government. They can only investigate people underneath them. Erdogan can only be investigated by the parliament. His party controls the parliament. That's not possible. So they are trying to bring me down is a lie. That, that's, that was not possible. If he, he was convinced that the courts are biased, there is the appeal court. If he thinks that the appeal court is biased, there is a Supreme Court, Constitutional Court. If he thinks Constitutional Court is also biased, there is the European Court of Human Rights, which Turkey has to abide by. So there is no reason to shut down the investigation, but, uh, but he did it. And then in 2014, right after that, he began hate speech. And he said things that no Muslims should say to any other Muslim. 
He said things like, I have a video here, but I don't want to play it. I just want to show you a picture of it. He said things like blood-sucking vampires in national TV. He said, these people, Gulen sympathizers, they are blood-sucking vampires. They are leeches. They are animals. They're going to go to the dance of these animals in national TV. He turned this into a political campaign to gather support to turn the attention away from the corruption. Potential corruption, because it was never tried. Now, the July 15 incident uh, was uh, always, you know, often described as a failed coup attempt, but it was not really a coup attempt, because there was no leader, there was no plan. In our analysis, what we found was there were four or five uh, uh, major commanders who mobilized their units only to abandon them to be charged with coup attempt. So, special forces commander, uh, the uh, navy commander, air force commander, and the second chief of general staff. These four uh, generals mobilized a very small portion of the Turkish, one, one percent or so of the Turkish military, to give the impression of a coup. They gave the uh, impression to their subordinates that we are actually staging a coup, and the, uh, the soldiers get orders not for a coup, the orders of the soldiers are to protect the presidential palace, to protect the general staff office, to protect this, and prote there's a terrorist attack, you're supposed to go uh, protect it. These are all from the soldier testimonies. So, in the morning, uh, the commanders are gone, they are nowhere to be found, and the soldiers underneath them are charged with being uh, coup plotters. So, the people whom the government claims to be good and sympathizers in the military, they are not at the high level of Turkish military, not the chief of staff, not the force commander, not the army commanders, not army corps commanders. Who is doing this? All the people, soldiers, who are charged are low-level officers. And they are being charged with doing this coup. And how about the commanders who mobilized them? Nobody's questioning that. These four commanders that I mentioned, they mobilized the soldiers. They were never questioned by the courts. They were never uh, taken to justice. So we don't know exactly what, what happened. Those four commanders are not necessarily Erdogan sympathizers. They are uh, more like the Kemalists, hardline Kemalists. So they don't like you know, Muslim observance in the first place. But either they made an alliance with Erdogan, or Erdogan saw the situation and took advantage of it. Uh, but uh, there is no ground to charge any Islamist sympathizers to be behind this uh, event. Uh, and Hoca Efendi Sheikh Gülen condemned the event at the night before it was over. I was actually, I had prepared the message, condemnation message. And he said that if anybody is involved from the movement, that is against our core values. Uh, so we were very clear in our presence, but unfortunately, you know, for political purposes, this event was uh, manipulated and the vote was misled. But as you know, none of the other governments bought that uh, story. Right? So uh, I met with a lady in Pennsylvania where Mr. Gülen lives. Turkish radio television approached this lady and they said that, you know that this Shay here uh, organized a coup in Turkey. Uh, that, that's what our government says. And the lady looked at them, she told me this story. The, the lady looked at them, are you telling me that a bald man here who is sick organized a coup in your country and you did not become a of it? Sorry, let's talk about something else. Don't, don't you know, make mockery of my intelligence. Uh, and then I met with a staffer in the Congress. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I don't follow Turkey very closely, but the next day after the attempt, I saw that 3,000 judges and prosecutors were arrested with ready lists. Then I said, this must be Erdogan's own doing. Uh, and there are, there are other people who, you know, who see that that's, uh, the Turkish government claims is uh, meaningless nonsense. So, coming back to your original part of the question, what is the difference? So, Erdogan's uh, group uh, believe, which we don't criticize, that you can serve uh, as a political party. You can be the voice of Muslims uh, as a political party. That's okay. You know, we're not against that. Uh, any party, anybody can form a party and uh, participate in the democratic process to represent the values and the voice of the Muslims. We're not against that. The problem is he expects unconditional allegiance, unconditional obedience. As I mentioned, the, the scholars in the Islamic tradition, they all face this trouble. Always the same thing happens. The political leader asks for unconditional allegiance. Whatever I do, you can endorse it. So that was the big trouble. His met movement does not believe in forming a party or becoming part of a party. We believe that we should stay in equal distance to the parties. And whoever party, whichever party, represents the Islamic values best or human values best, we will vote for them. So our support is conditional. It is not unconditional. So Erdogan could not accept this. And this did not only happen to the Islamic movement, uh, by the way. There are smaller uh, Muslim groups in Turkey who suffer the same fate. 
Their leaders also refused to give unconditional allegiance, and they also suffered. Their institutions were taken away. Their leaders were jailed in Turkey. So that's the big difference. Unconditional allegiance, expectation for it, versus support based on principle. Thank you, Dr. Aslan. I'm really looking for an excellent lecture from you. And I would have to say one thing that, one thing I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Arif Khan, and I'm a, I'm a graduate of the Middle East Technical University. I'm Grand Turkey. And I graduated then in 1973, the times of Dennis Gazbich and his <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you know Turkish history by, by heart. By heart. <laughs> anyway, I was a, <clears throat> a guest of Fatela uh, <clears throat> Gulen's group in 2006, actually. That was my university, Turkey at university. And we went to different places with them. And one was the Pony, of course. While going to different locations, what we did was that we stopped into different dormitories. And I was so impressed that all the dormitories have the schools connected with them, and every school has normal classes going on, except for one room where they have a mosque. Besides that, what they have also in all the subjects, before that, there was no Islamic studies a lesson was taught in any of the Turkish schools at the time. And in that school, there was only one class where they talked about religious, religious education, but besides that, they have all the top level education given to all the students. And the students were brought from all over the place from Turkey. And that was very impressive because I remember in 1956, one of the speech which I have read of John Lan Nehru was that the best investment in edu uh, return on investment is on education. And he opened those IITs in the 1950s. And that's what I see where in, in what Mustafa, you know, what Fatih al is doing. So I'm just saying, besides the politics, because I also don't like Erdogan because of his authoritarian regime. So besides that, that's about Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add on to that excellent comment, um, education is empowerment. Empowerment, educate, education empowers people. But you also have to uh, know what you are empowering. So we, we have seen in the past, unfortunately, that people uh, trained in certain skills uh, did turn up uh, violent. Uh, so in the Ismet schools, uh, as in I'm sure in all of the uh, Muslim schools in the Chicagoland area, uh, the idea is that uh, we are empowering, but we are also uh, educating the character. So that what we empower should be a good character. So that is the kind of the common theme among, I think, all Muslim uh, many schools. Uh, uh, my name is Sayyid Abdan. I'm a high school student for Russian. So my question is for the Hizmet uh, system, for the movement, what is the ideological uh, uh, spectrum of where it places? Now, the thing is, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, which was, you know, uh, spread the ideology of pan-Islamism. Mm -hmm. Is it somewhat related to that, or is it somewhat related to the liberalistic ideologies of the democratic systems, you know, in America or the Western nations? Uh, I think I can uh, safely, confidently say that Hizmet does not necessarily have a separate ideology, but Hizmet understanding is. Maybe sh should we turn on, turn off one of the mic mics? Okay. Uh, so his main uh, outlook or perspective is that uh, either all or most of the uh, universal human values are actually Islamic values. Uh, so may, there may be some exceptions that, that some some humans may not agree, but for the vast majority of the Islamic values are also universal human values and vice versa. That means uh, we can gather around them. Sometimes I uh, ask people, imagine uh, the globe uh, with the political map on it. Right? So you see borders and colors. There is a Turkey, Syria, Greece, so on and so forth, India, Pakistan. And if you consider the world map, the globe of religions, you see a little bit more mixed, but still a map with colors and boundaries. 
roughly speaking. What if you think about the world where we don't do a religious map or political map, but we do a map based on people's values and actions? People who believe in human dignity for all, people who have hope for humanity, who believe in the potential of humanity, people who believe in equality, people who believe in empowerment through education and justice. Okay, just you can expand this list. Versus people who are engaged in hatred, racism, polarization, people who are engaged in only serving themselves or their group. If you consider these two kinds of people, and I'm not saying that they are cast in stone, they cannot change, everybody can change, so there's hope for everybody. But for some people in their lives, the first set of values are dominant. Hope, equality, human dignity. These are dominant. And for some other people, separation, polarization, self-benefit or group benefit is dominant at the time. If you think about the map of these people, what kind of map do you get? It is dark and bright spots all around the globe. It is among Muslims, it is among Christians, Jews, and everywhere. Right? So his man's approach is that we can gather all humans around these values to make our society a better place. As our Dr. Jill Carroll mentioned some years ago, you may believe that I am uh, destined for hell, uh, if you like you know, Christians think more Muslims are destined for hell and vice versa, so on and forth. You may believe that I am destined for hell, but let's not turn this world into hell. And in, in Gudan's uh, uh, literature, you, you find this concept uh, when he talks about the Quranic descriptions of the uh, Jannah, paradise, right? So the Quran describes uh, different aspects of the paradise. It is so beautiful, uh, you know, the trees and uh, fruits there that resemble the ones in, in the world, but they are really different. Uh, you know, there is no pain and suffering there. Uh, everything is beautiful in harmony and reflecting the names of God. Gulen says that you, don't, you should not take these uh, verses only as a description of a future, something to encourage you to reach there. You should think of it as, can we turn this world into something that resembles that? So, there are people who believe in this. So the, his main idea is that people who share these values can come together around these values, diversity, uh, within boundaries, equality, human dignity, and make our societies better places. And if these principles are held onto, you can see that many of the troubles that we are facing can actually be resolved. The, the wars can definitely be resolved. Environmental pollution can be resolved. Racism can be resolved. If people who share these values work together, that is the Islamic ideal. It's not an ideology, uh, but it is based on the Islamic tradition, Islamic values, which we believe to be also human universal values. Yes, go ahead. So it's more lenient towards Sufism, where uh, you know how you. You, you can you can say so, but we, we I don't want to say Sufism because Sufism is an umbrella term, other Sufi term. Unfortunately, there are also groups that are outside of Islamic principles. Ismet is so uh, sound based in the Quran and Sunnah, and Sunnah and Jama'at tradition. So I don't want to use that term, uh, but I say Islam tradition. That's what I meant, Islam tradition. So like, instead of much more like Christians and other people. Yeah, the idea is coming around the shared values, coming from different roots, respecting our roots, preserving our roots, not forcing anybody to change their identity, but working around the common ideals. That's the idea. I can give you this one. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Dr. Alp is an old friend of mine, as he mentioned uh, earlier. With your permission, um, it was not really a question that I had, but a, a comment. Um, I think in the spirit of this conversation, part of which I think is demystifying Hizmet, and its history and its contributions to society, including in the United States. I wanted to sort of give my own uh, testimony uh, and my own experience with this organization or with this movement. I'm someone who is um, known in the Muslim community as a leader, a servant, an activist, whatever you want to call it. It, it was working fine before. <laughs> and I met 
um, Brother Alp, Dr. Alp, early on, when I was a freshman in college and he was doing his PhD, and we struck a friendship and he was sort of the entry point for me into this world to get to learn about this community. And since that time, I got to know a lot more people, hundreds, thousands of people around the world. I've traveled to Turkey with some of them a few times. I've been to Turkey probably 29 times, but the majority of those were on my own. Maybe three or four were with his brothers and sisters. And I've gotten very close with these communities and got to see them internally. Today, as I defend the Hizmet against what I consider to be unfair persecution and human rights abuses in Turkey, I'm often accused by my own community of being biased, hating Erdogan, being a Golanist. You will remember that back when nobody wanted to defend the Muslim Brotherhood when they were attacked on Fox News, I was defending them. And I was also accused then of being a Muslim Brotherhood operative. And that was okay by me because I stand for human rights and I stand for what I believe is true. When I defended Palestinian rights and Palestinians, I was often accused very loudly and very widely of being Hamas and a Hamas-linked operative. And that was okay by me. It was a worthy price to pay for standing up for human rights and what is true. In this instance, too, I make no apologies for standing with this community, despite how unpopular it might be in some quarters of our community. And I actually turn back, sort of mirror, to my community and say, shame on anyone who sits this out. Because it is easy for you, if you like this president or like his government, for some good things that they've done, and they've done some good things. I'm not somebody who is black and white. I don't believe in extremist takes on global affairs. I believe in critical thinking. I do believe that this president, Erdogan, has done some good things in his career. I believe he's brought Muslims on the map against extremist secularism. I believe he cleaned up Istanbul when he was a mayor. I believe in the early years he put Turkey on the map economically and culturally and still does to a degree. I believe he's a smart politician. I believe he did well with the Syrians and in some cases with the Palestinian um, a situation. In some cases not so much. But also that this same person allowed his ego, allowed his power trip to excommunicate citizens and persecute en masse families and communities in order to protect a, a, a power grab or a grasp on power. A person can be capable of good and bad things. And for us to either glorify someone to the moon that they can do no wrong or demonize them to hell that they can do no right is part of the problem of Muslim society and really society around the world today. We have to be critical, we have to be fair-minded. That is what I try to do as a Muslim, that's how my father raised me, Allah al But that is also what my prophet taught me to do, whatever the consequences, whatever the consequences. So I want to conclude by saying, the reason why I defend this community is because of the established human rights abuses that are witnessed to by experts around the world who are neutral, the same top institutions that we often cite on issues that matter to the larger community, like Palestine, like Syria, like Egypt, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, these same agencies are the ones giving us lots of data and proof and evidence of these persecutions. And now, for many in our community, suddenly it's a conspiracy, and these individuals, for some odd reason, are involved in conspiracy. We have families here who can give you personal witness to what's happening to their friends and family. We know it extends to teachers, to doctors, to nurses, to their families, to the elderly, to people who have nothing to do with politics, even if you believe, which I believe would be wrongly for you to do so, but even if you believe that they were involved in some criminal conspiracy, political conspiracy in Turkey, by what reason can we extend persecution to hundreds of thousands of people who demonstrably, evidently, had nothing to do with the decision of a few, assuming that even happened in the first place? That, I think, no one can make any argument for, and as a result, we must stand for humanity and for what is right. I know this community is good, not because of something I've read, not even the reports from Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, but because of my interaction with the individuals, with the families. It's not even because, with all due respect, and I admire this person, Fethullah Gulen, Hoj Effendi, and I've met him a couple of times, it's not even because of him and his writings. There are a lot of good people writing a lot of great things. But because when I interacted with the rank and file, with the families, I mean, this has to be one massive conspiracy, one brilliant piece of acting for these people around the world that I've met in many countries to be this humble 
and this driven by service, and this altruistic, and this effective and efficient. When I see these human beings, I say these are good human beings doing good things. I wish we had more of them in the world, and it pains me to see them persecuted or demonized, and it pains me even more to see our own Muslim community turn their back because it's politically expedient and convenient, and pretend it's not happening or even join in the persecution. I have never benefited from saying this. Some people say, oh, Ahmed is a Gulenist. Ahmed gets financial you know, reward. I've never got a penny from, this, from these people. The most I've got are nice dinners, not enough to sell my soul. Great dinners, but not enough <laughs> to sell my soul. So I just want to say, you know, my heart is with the persecuted people around the world, including this community. I think you've done good things in the world, and I pray that you come back on your, your feet to fully continue the education, the work against poverty and for charity, and the fellowship and engagement that this world so sorely needs. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Uh, we have Nizam Azamuddin here, a longtime friend. He just recently appointed by uh, as a commissioner in Illinois Supreme Court. And let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, great to have you all. Um, I think the last time you did a presentation where I saw you make a presentation was the first time I met you, which was 1999. Wow. And you were giving a presentation on religion and science. And, um, and then we had breakfast after that. So it's interesting, like almost 25 years later, we I see you making this like, presentation. You should come more often. Um, uh, I'm glad Ahmed made the statement which he did about his support. I want to sort of address a little bit of a different issue, which is why, as somebody from the Muslim community, somebody who's steeped in religion, who comes from a religious practicing uh, South Asian Muslim family, what appealed to me about Hizmet? And this kind of addresses some of the questions that this young man had at my table, too. What I found so uh, uh, attractive about Hizmet was it was the only movement that I came across, and I studied as an academic, I studied many Islamic movements around the country, and in particular in the United States. What I found unique and so attractive by Hizmet was it was the first movement that did not hate the West, and yet was very Islamic and spiritual. And that's the key. So many other Islamic movements are anti-West, anti-modern, anti-European, etc. And I think the legacy of the Ottoman Empire which was an Islamic empire, which was also a European empire, is what sort of set the trend for future movements in Turkey, particularly Hizmet as well. And that's why I think um, <clears throat> Said Nursi was so important, because Said Nursi bridged the gap between Islam and modernity as well, and so did Hoja Fendi and so forth. So that's why, particularly for the young people here, I want to sort of stress why the Hizmet movement is so necessary in the United States. It's because it is the movement that continues the legacy of Islam from an intellectual perspective, which is the Hanafi Mataroudi uh, theology, and continues the legacy of Tasawwuf and Sufism, or as you call it, Ihsan, which was important institutionally in the Muslim world for a thousand years. The Hanafi Madhab has been around for a thousand years. It maintained the coherence and continuation of Islamic teachings. And the Hizmet movement is not 